Could this back-breaking, buzzer-beating loss at the hands of Harrison Barnes and the Sacramento Kings be just what the Suns need to kick it back into high gear? Recapping a Suns 110-107 loss, next on Locked on Suns. You are Locked on Suns. Your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We are back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, and I am your host, Brendan Clean, credentialed media member covering the Suns the past five seasons. Follow the show on Twitter at Locked On PHX Suns. Follow me on Twitter at Brendan Clean 14. Subscribe if you do not already to the Locked On Suns YouTube channel. Constantly updating content there. We're going to be doing smaller clips, live shows, and all sorts of new things as the season goes along. You can also, of course, listen to us on your favorite podcast app. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen. Every single day, you got a ton of options. You got a ton of different shows out there, a ton of different ways to engage with your Phoenix Suns. You choose us. That is what gets me going, what makes me come back and do this for you. I love it. I love getting to be part of this with you. Although, not so much on days like this one 110 107 loss, last second, the buzzer echoing through the arena as Harrison Barnes three swishes through the net after a wild finish to this game frankly the suns outscore the kings 31 to 28 in the fourth quarter after a just abysmal third quarter where buddy heald goes off 252 left in this game darren fox hits a three that puts the kings up 10 everybody's going home they think this game is done well, the Suns had other thoughts. They go on a 12-2 run. The only bucket actually in that run for Sacramento was another Harrison Barnes bucket. They tie the game. All 15 of the Suns' points from that point on would be scored on or assisted by Devin Booker. Booker misses a potential game-winning shot on the Suns' side, guarded by Buddy Heald. Pump fakes. Gets the, the defense actually to be even closer to him on the part of Buddy Heald. Misses the mid-range jumper that he tries. And then, of course, 3.7, 3.4, something like that. Seconds left on the clock. The Kings inbound the ball. Get it to Harrison Barnes. Left wing. Deep, deep three. And it does go in. Kings escape an overtime game. Win. Again, they should have. Sacramento should have won this game after the third quarter that they put together. And... Go home victors. So one and three start to the season. And I want to get into all of it as usual. We will talk about right here the main takeaway. I'm chomping at the bit to tell you why this game actually could be a positive in a way you're not necessarily expecting. I also think we need to talk about DeAndre Ayton for talking about the good, which we typically do. And then we will close out the show definitely with our bench mob vibe check. That is a recurring segment that I know. I'm going to go back to, I got two guys already in mind. Actually, I think I might have one more positive for you guys as well. But first of all, my big takeaway, Um, I need some sort of sound or visual here to signify this segment starting. It's going to be how I start every game recap show, at least as much as, look, if it's a blowout or something like that, I don't know. So I don't necessarily know if we'll always have some big point to make. But this one is actually real, and I believe it to my core. The Suns will use this game as a jumping off point, as a springboard to turn things around. Not that there anything necessarily needed to be turned around. This team is far from failing. However, you know, oh, it, oh and two at home is no way to start. They are not looking like themselves or not, as Monty Williams highlighted post game, generating threes or defending the three point line. You cannot win in the NBA right now if you can't do at least one, if not both of those things. And they're not, they're just not looking great at anything. You know what I mean? They don't have a part of their team or of their system or of their style that they can hang their hat on right now. 
And that really bites you too. You can't fall back on one thing, rebounding, defense, three-point shooting, playmaking, and ball movement. A lot of those things actually were, were trademarks and hallmarks of the Suns last year. They're not doing anything particularly great right now for 48 straight minutes. I think all of that changes after this game. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I think this game was a wake-up call because the Suns uh, don't have an excuse for this one, right? I mean, you could look and say Buddy Heald made four threes in the third quarter. He had 14 points in that third quarter. It is what it is, right? I mean, I I don't see that as an excuse per se. I don't see that as something where the Suns are going to feel okay that that happened. So Portland, it's like, well, CJ McCollum goes off. That's a, a thing that he does. Portland has a pretty incredible offense from a talent standpoint, from a roster standpoint. The Nuggets game, it's like, you know, they're the Nuggets. They're a great team. They're a you know, very high-level team, and it was opening night and whatever. This one, there's not really anything to point to. There's no excuse, and I think they were all on the same page about that. Monty, Mikhail, Jay Crowder, who we spoke with, and DeAndre Ayton all basically said, like, you know, this one stings. This one is not really explainable, no excuse for it, and so... That to me signifies that they're looking at this one and they're and they're getting pretty frustrated with themselves. You don't lose a home game to the Kings coming off of three days of rest. You just don't. I did predict that we might see this, not to pat myself on the back, but if you guys have been watching this team, as you all have been, you you were not necessarily surprised that the three-point line was a problem, that the Kings had um, some success, you know, moving the ball and, and pushing the pace and scoring that way. Rashawn Holmes had one at the end of the first half that was pointed to. We saw some transition offense for guys like Tyrese Halliburton. None of these things were necessarily a huge surprise, but the team is disappointed in itself, and it should be. The other reason I think this one will truly be a wake-up call, well, I got two more for you. One is, is Jay Crowder said post game that, you know, there was a level of accountability that needed to be taken post game and that that those conversations are are starting in terms of let's level with ourselves kick ourselves out of this gear before we really get in a hole and that the leaders of this team are starting to speak up jay crowder basically said that and he said speaking from i just asked him is there another point in your career that you're thinking of in this moment and he said not necessarily one but that having been on teams in the past where that first month goes awry, which I mean, you could say about last year's Suns and they were able to figure things out. But generally speaking, he said, you don't want to let things get bad for too long because it can really multiply. And so that gives me optimism that this team is starting to just kind of be honest with itself and realize, look, we can't keep lollygagging. We can't wait for things to work out. We need to make them work out. Um, Lastly, I think the reason that this game could be a real wake-up call is that Devin Booker looked a lot better. He took charge of this game when it needed to be taken charge of. Chris Paul sat from about the six-minute mark to the one-and-a-half-minute mark. He maybe should have sat the entire game. Landry Shamit was on the floor during those minutes with the starters. Point Book made a reappearance, and he, re- like I said, he, he, let, he scored or assisted on 15 straight points. He was getting rebounds. He was getting defensive stops. He was fighting on the offensive glass. He actually had a loose ball foul that I did not mind whatsoever during the run because it was just sort of a an energy moment, a sort of point that he was making to his teammates of, you know, I'm not letting us lose this game, although, of course, they ended up losing. He was showing them with his energy that they were going to get back into it, and they did. So Booker... 12 of 28 is not ideal. He missed some easy threes that he you know, normally would make that were open. However, I just think this game, zero turnovers for him. This, this really looks like it could be a turning point for him specifically. So, you know, missed a lot of easy shots that they should have made. Did not play with the usual pace, even not, you know, fast break points, but just pace in terms of decision-making, 0.5 offense, trusting each other on defense. None of that was there. That's still a problem until the last couple minutes. But what we heard from after them, uh, what we heard from them after the game and what we saw in those final few minutes make me believe that that this really could be a turning point. So that's my big takeaway. That's what I'm walking away from this game thinking. We'll get into more of the positives coming up here as well. DeAndre Ayton and Mikhail Bridges too. First though, a quick word from Rock Auto. 
look, you have, like me, walked into a chain store or heaven forbid a dealership and been screwed over, just point blank. That is what happens. You need a part. They know that they have all the leverage because you're in a little bit of an emergency. They tell you it's going to be double, triple what you were expecting and you have no choice but to deal with it. Well, actually, that's not true. Rock Auto is the other choice. Rock Auto is the better choice. And they solve the expense problem and the efficiency problem both. So why spend 30, 50, even 100% more for the same exact parts at a chain store dealership when you could go to Rock Auto? They know what they're doing. They've been doing this, serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. They don't even require a login, let alone a membership. So they make it easy. They make it cheap. And they do it on your terms. Just type in your car, scroll down to the part that you need, click purchase, and it's at your door in days. That easy. Go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck, and write locked on in their how did you hear about us box when you make your purchase so they know we sent you. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, and all the parts your car will ever need. Rockauto.com. Bet online is back and better than ever as well. And new web interface courtesy of bet online for the start of the basketball season meaning more odds props and lines than ever before they are pumping the site full of things to bet on bet online remains your number one spot for all basketball and football action all season long head to that new updated website or check out their mobile app sign up today and when you do use the promo code locked on when you make your first deposit to get a 50 percent welcome bonus that's promo code locked on when you make your first deposit to get a 50 percent welcome bonus straight to your account from basketball and football to the baseball postseason and even your va- favorite vegas casino games don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available throughout the 2021 season bet online is the fastest way and the easiest way to bet on all of your favorite sports bet online where the game starts. Positives from the Suns 110-107 loss in devastating fashion. We'll get to the positives though. Don't want to dwell on the sadness here. Thank you once again for making Locked on Suns your first listen. The place you go right after games to get the latest, to get my thoughts, to think back through the game, remember it, recollect reminisce, enjoy, maybe revel in your sorrow a little bit, whatever it might be. Those are all of my SAT words for you. Let's get into the positives here, though. DeAndre Ayton, 9 of 12, 21 points, 21 rebounds, 5 offensive boards, his second 2020 game of his career. The quiz show version of this segment would be for me to ask you when the other one was, but since none of you are actually in this room with me, I don't know how I would get your answer, so I will go ahead and tell you. The last one he had was on the road in New York just prior to COVID hitting, and I'm sure all of you will remember that. That was really his big, big breakout. He played that game in uh, Madison Square Garden. He also had a big game in Boston, had a great game against the Mavericks. Stringing together those performances was really when he put himself on the map for me and for most Suns fans. And so to match that production production is really, really incredible. I mean, he also had that big game in game three or four of the conference finals, that 85, 84, whatever that game was. So we know he's capable of these types of games. His rebounding really made an impact. We know what Rashawn Holmes can do if you allow his energy to take over games. Aiton was able to match that huge game from him. Don't want to go too far into the negative. However, there was, I also do want to say on the positive, Aiton also had two or three big defensive plays late in the game. The Harrison Barnes layup during that four, that 12-2 run was not a very good contest by Aiton, but he also did make a few differential plays in that stretch too to keep the Kings from scoring because you got to stop the other team just as much as you got to score yourself in those types of runs. So credit to him there. There was also an iffy one where he got called for a foul on De'Aaron Fox. I don't think it should have been a foul, so... The defense was solid too. Like I said, though, not to get into a negative here because it it is really a positive, but it became a little bit on the con side is he was 9 of 11 in the first half. I think he had a double-double in the first quarter alone and then only gets one shot attempt the entire second half. I think it was in the fourth quarter and he made it and he wanted the end one actually. 
I'm sure you'll remember that one. And so that's the negative. Why do you not get this guy shots? Monty Williams called it a conundrum. They obviously want to, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. They obviously should continue to do what's working, but it's up to Chris Paul and Devin Booker and, and Cameron Payne when he's in there, Alfred Payton, to get him in position where he can create shots and score and do so efficiently when he has it going. Can't always count on the offensive rebounds. I don't think we should be in a position here where we're talking about feeding DeAndre Ayton. Anyone who's ever listened to this show knows I hate that idea, but I do think there's something to just the hot hand, right? I mean, you know, rewarding work, rewarding a good game and continuing to go to that guy. I know that it's harder and because of the limitations of his skill set, I've never really been one to make this point. I think if you are in a situation where you are winning games or competitive in games and you don't necessarily need to go back and micromanage and say, oh, this player should have gotten two, three more shots, but they are losing games right now. And he has been a consistent bright spot in a lot of these matchups. So I do think there's something to the idea that do what's working, ride that hot hand. Now, the other quick positive here is Mikhail Bridges. Um, And I don't, I just one specific thing for him. He continues to get up there in field goal attempts. That's very good to see. But more specifically than that, what I really wanted to highlight here is in the late game situation during the last two minutes and 52 seconds when the Suns mounted their comeback, were able to even the score and all of that. One of the buckets that really was a deciding factor late was a Mikhail Bridges. He attacked a closeout, got into the middle of the floor and had a, a, a free throw line jumper that I think might become one of his signatures. It was at Villanova. It may become that again over the course of this season. Very, very incredible for him to have the confidence and to not only be able to take a three in that situation, but to put the ball on the ground, make that shot, go up confidently and make it with the game in the Suns grasp. So that was very good to see. And he took a big three in a big moment. Not that I had any doubt about that, but did he did miss it. He was obviously disappointed as he talked about post game, um, felt off right away, went a little bit to the right and missed out on that opportunity to, I believe it would have been either an earlier tie or maybe taking the lead if I'm remembering correctly, if he had made it, but just him taking those shots being put into position and the teammates that he has on the floor with him, trusting him there. That's all continued signs of progress as both of these two young guys try to become more of a fulcrum for this son's offense. Want to close the show with our usual bench mob vibe check. I'm going to come up with more of these final segment post game podcast. Um, mini segments within the final segment. I'm going to come up with more, I promise. Cam Johnson's breakout watch, not a lot to get to, 0 4 for him. So I will do a little bit more on the bench today as I see what comes to me for the final segments here. First though, a quick word from Postmates, a new sponsor of today's show. We love to see it. Do you guys smell that Hmm, in the air? It is my favorite food. Yes, that's right. Uh, Let's see. What am I smelling from the Suns Arena still that I would love to have more of? A brownie. That is the chocolate, the peanut butter in that brownie. It showed up at my door because, well, I couldn't help but ask for more after enjoying it at Footprint Center. With Postmates, I get all of my favorite foods from the local restaurants in my neighborhood delivered, no leaving the house, and even better, no getting in the car or even finding a parking spot. Postmates isn't all just burritos and sushi or brownies. You can also order things like toothpaste and phone chargers on demand too. That's because places like Walgreens and 7-Eleven and tons of other convenience stores and supermarkets are also on Postmates. Look, this is coming handy for a lot of people that I know. You know, not to be dark, but it's not even about getting sick. It's just the quarantining you have to do. We are in this era where that's life right now. Those orders are beautiful when you have to stay at home. My favorite part, when the app, the Postmates app, lets me know that my food or items have been delivered, everything's right outside my door. You walk out, you grab it, and you're done. It's so cool. It never gets old, and it is so satisfying. Download the Postmates app on iOS or Android. Find your favorite foods or that one thing you forgot to get from the store and get it delivered on demand. And for a limited time, Postmates is giving our listeners a little something extra. New customers will get 50% off your first five orders of $50 or more. Perfect for the family, maybe a grocery order. 
when you use the promo code Locked On NBA. That's Locked On NBA, all one word to get 50% off your first five orders of $50 or more. Max savings of $100 per order. Just download the Postmates app or sign up online. Super easy. Offer subject to change and taxes and fees apply. Offer valid for 30 days after you add the promo code to your account. Bench mob vibe check. It is time for our nightly segment, our post game podcast segment. I'm going to integrate it. Two guys under the radar to look at here as we close out the show. JaVale McGee. Um, I'm not going to take back my optimism about the signing. I think that he is a positive. I think that he allows Aiton to play more freely. He also pushes Aiton to play at a high level, knowing that there is a backup behind him. And I'm not saying that there's been any doubt to start the season, whether which of those guys should be getting minutes. But I like all of the things that adding McGee does for this roster from a roster construction standpoint. What I have not liked is the way that McGee is operating on the floor so far. You know, there's the awkwardness. He's a lot of limb. He flails. He ends up on the floor a lot. There's just that awkwardness to his game that's fun and unique and weird and maybe frustrating. I don't really think it's actual negative plays. I think he just kind of embraces it a little bit. What I am talking about that I have been displeased with about his performance is the lack of patience. And what I mean by that is he bail, he's he's been a turnover machine. And I think a lot of that is resulting from we're seeing this offense not create the types of shots that we're used to seeing it create, right? No three-pointers, only 22 three-point attempts tonight. And bailing on possessions. I've been talking about Alfred Payton's questionable so- shot selection. I think the same goes for McGee himself taking ill-advised floaters and jumpers when there are better shots available. And I think that that just comes out of a lack of patience. You know, you could look at that and say, well, he's not used to this system yet. And I would totally agree. I mean, he's in game number four of his tenure here. But what doesn't add up to me about that is he played for the Warriors for multiple seasons. And that is a system and a half-court offense that really relies on ball movement and patience and trust in your teammates and, and communication and all these things. So I don't necessarily get it from that standpoint. Now, maybe it's breaking bad habits that he developed while he was with the Cavs at the beginning of last season and chucking shots, and then he didn't play much at all with Denver. Maybe not a coincidence that the Nuggets didn't necessarily trust him to execute their offense without um, that impatience creeping in. The Lakers didn't really ask him to be much of a ball mover or, you know, he's not involved in the offense with the ball in his hands much. So maybe it's just that he's getting back into the flow of playing that way. That's the nice version. The not so nice version is he is less of a good fit with this offense than we thought. And it's probably going to fall somewhere in the middle. Again, I'm not overreacting. I still think the move was good. And I still think he'll be a positive part of this team. But right now he is not getting the job done. He's really been a negative on offense, in my opinion. There have not been a lot of finishes and lobs and all the things we are used to seeing from him. And when he has been involved, it's been mostly bad. So that needs to change if the Suns want to win these bench minutes more consistently and just have his full impact be felt. The other guy I want to talk about is Abdul Nader, not because of what he did or even when he was out there, but for the lack of a presence for Nader five minutes in this game. And when you're talking about the fact that Buddy Heald was able to get hot, you saw, you know, Tyrese Halliburton at times be able to get it going. He's more of an off ball player, but we did see him make a difference. And then De'Aaron Fox, of course, just a player that you always need to account for, even though he was just seven of 20 in this one. So all of that is happening. All of that's playing out. The Suns are not generating threes. And they don't play this 3 and D option. Now, I get it. Look, Devin Booker played 37 minutes. This is a game that they clearly wanted to win. They want the top six or seven players on this roster. Well, with Payne out, it's really more of six, with Cam Johnson being number six on there, to be playing as many minutes as possible. So there's not a ton of space for Nader in this rotation to be playing huge minutes 
but five is significantly less than he had been playing, even on a night when the thing that Monty has said he values most, which is Nader's on-ball defense, was really necessary and could have been pretty useful. Also, a um, little bit off topic, but they completely embarrassed Dooley on the Jumbotron during this game. They had him do a word scramble where he had to try to find small words within the letters that make up the phrase slam dunk. They played it for everybody to hear. First of all, they botched the girl who did it beforehand. He, she was supposed to be competing against a player. It was a pre-recorded video. They had already put it on Twitter. It was awkward and bad enough then, and they doubled down, played it overhead for everybody to see. I know Frank Kaminsky was watching. I saw him looking up, and I'm sure that Julie heard it. Give the man some respect. He's already losing minutes, and now you're embarrassing him in front of his home fans all over the the arena for everybody to see. It is cruel. It is unusual, and it only compounded a bad night for Nader. In real land, in real talk here, I, I am actually going to be interested to see if this continues. They're facing uh, Cleveland on Saturday, another game where – They'll be facing, you know, some perimeter scorers, some scorers overall who could do some damage. If he doesn't become sort of a defensive check for hot scorers or teams with perimeter talent, and he doesn't necessarily consistently do a lot of other things. I mean, he can make open, wide open threes. He can theoretically get downhill. We haven't seen that as much so far this season with the pace slow. He could be the odd man out. And even with Cameron Payne not in the rotation, Alfred Payton has taken those minutes and Nader is down there in minutes. So not saying that it's permanent, not saying that it's an indictment on him. It's just what the team needs, what Monty seems to want. And it's uh, just a trend to monitor. This is a player that they were talking up heading into the season and already game four here. He's taken a little bit of a dip. We'll see what happens moving forward. On that note, we will actually be talking about a little bit more Nader and McGee in addition to Landry Shamit with Damon Allred of Bright Side of the Sun on tomorrow's show. So be on the lookout for that. We're doing first impressions of the new additions to this rotation. I know Nader's not completely new, but full time, he is definitely in a new role. So we'll talk about him and the rest of the new guys here with Damon to close out the week. Thank you for listening. Don't take the loss too hard. And I will talk to you on Thursday.